Wild Pokemon are a staple of any Pokemon playthrough. Everyone knows the music and lighting cues, the species reveal, and of course, the iconic text. A wild Pokemon appeared. These features are so integral to the gameplay that without them, Pokemon just wouldn't feel the same. But that got me thinking, if wild Pokemon are such a fundamental part of the experience, would it theoretically be possible to play an entire game of Pokemon without running into a single one? No shot, right? Between unavoidable areas, forced interactions, and static encounters, seeing at least one wild Pokemon has to be mandatory. Well, I'm not so sure. After thinking about this for a long time, I realize there may be one game where this is possible, but hypothetically, avoiding every single wild Pokemon would involve meticulous planning, perfectly executed actions, and crucially, a whole lot of luck. But is it possible for all of this to actually happen? Can a run of Pokemon truly be completed with zero wild encounters? I wanted to figure this out once and for all. So join me as I attempt to play Pokemon without seeing a single wild Pokemon. So let's talk about what game could work for this. Of all the main series games, one stood out to me as having the least opportunities for potential wild encounters. And that game is Pokemon Black and White. I'll talk more about why as we go. I begin by selecting my gender and name, and I'm immediately dropped into my house in Nuvema Town. Sitting in my bedroom are the starter Pokemon, making the concept of a gift Pokemon as literal as possible. To select a starter, other games like Diamond and Pearl or Ruby and Sapphire will force you into a wild Pokemon encounter. However, there's no wild Pokemon here, just a choice to make. Since wild Pokemon are completely off the table, my starter is going to be my primary option for working my way through the game. So, the starting Pokemon I select will make or break the entire run. There are two major things I need to consider. How strong will my starter be? at taking on the trainers in this game, and, even more importantly, what necessary HMs can the starter learn? HMs, or hidden machines, are moves learned by Pokémon that have additional overworld functionality, including cutting trees, moving boulders, flying from place to place, and surfing across bodies of water. But here in the magical world of Unova, HMs are almost entirely unnecessary. So any starter is totally viable here, and boils down to whichever I think would work best. I ultimately go with Oshawott, and battle both Charon and Bianca before having to face my greatest fear, going outside. Outside is where wild Pokemon live, but at least in towns and cities, I'm generally safe. Professor Juniper asks three children to do her adult job for her, and allows me to name Oshawott. Since I'm trying to avoid the gross, disgusting, germy, feral Pokemon that lurk outside, I name Oshawott Purell, hoping his cleansing water will sanitize this run. To complete this challenge all the way through the champion, I have a bit of traveling to do before I reach the Pokemon League. Juniper leads us on to Route 1, where we find the first major roadblock in this challenge, Tall Grass. There are certain locations in this game where wild Pokemon can be found, and tall grass is the most common. Juniper steps into the grass and encounters a wild pat rat, but this is her encountering it, not us. So this interaction is allowed. However, to make it to the next location, we need to walk through this patch of grass without entering a wild Pokemon battle. Each tile we step on has a chance of triggering an encounter, and here we have seven tiles to get through. There's nothing we can do to avoid this. It's pure luck. All that we can do is pray that we... Okay, three tiles in, and it's over. A wild pat rat appeared, so we can no longer say we saw zero wild Pokemon. If this happens, I'm going to reset the entire run. No save states or anything. We start all the way over. The second try makes it to the last tile of grass, but on the third attempt, I make it out unscathed. However, this is not the only patch of grass on Route 1. Five more tiles of terror, and we are through to Accumulatown. Here we find a Pokemon Center, which also contains a Pokemart. 
However, the item we're looking for is not available yet, so we must continue to Route 2, where more insidious patches of grass lie. The shortest path here is a whopping 13 tiles, which, of course, we can't make it through. Attempt 4 ends the same way. But on attempt 5, something absolutely insane happens. During Professor Juniper's intro, she reveals a shiny Mancino. I didn't even know this was a thing that could happen. Of course, this Pokemon cannot be caught, but I find it absolutely hilarious that in a game where I'm actively avoiding wild Pokemon, I find a shiny. Like, of course that would happen. This next attempt fails as well, but finally, on attempt 6, I make it through that long patch of grass, which just leaves me one final hurdle. I step in and walk all the way through. So finally, I make it to Striaton City without running into a wild Pokemon. Before I go on, I'd like to ask you to consider subscribing to this channel. I like to push the limit of what's possible in Pokemon, so if you enjoy that kind of content, you'll be glad you subscribed. Let's take a look at the Oshawott that finally made it through. It has a timid nature and the ability Torrent. Samurott works best as a special attacker, so minus attack is totally fine. Plus speed is increasing Oshawott's worst stat, but having more speed is totally fine by me. With no wild Pokemon to grind on for this challenge, I'm stuck gaining experience exclusively from trainer battles. Will this give me enough experience to get me through the entire game? I'm not sure. But for now, all I can do is fight every trainer available. Just east of Striaton is the Dream Yard, and here an NPC will give you a free Pokemon without having to encounter or catch a wild Pokemon. They give you an elemental monkey, and the one you receive is based on the starter you selected. Since I chose the water type Oshawott, I received the fire monkey, Panseer. Fire will help me stay away from the disgusting disgusting bugs. So, he'll be my insect repellent. With two Pokemon on the team, I need to decide who to use in trainer battles. Samurott is a much stronger Pokemon than Simiseer, so I decide to give as much experience to Purell as I can. Splitting experience is not the move, as I'd much rather have one strong Pokemon instead of two mediocre ones. Striaton City is the location of the first gym, so Purell takes on all the gym trainers, reaching level 13 by the time we take on the gym leader. We have to take on Sillin, the grass type leader, since the game always gives gives us a bad matchup against our starter. However, even at level 10, Repellent is strong enough to outlast Cress's Pansage and we get the first badge of the game. This is crucial because with one badge, the Pokemart begins selling new items, including the one item that potentially makes this challenge possible, repels. Repels prevent wild Pokemon from attacking you, but only Pokemon below your lead Pokemon's level. So Oshawott needs to stay at a high level throughout this challenge. Repels also cost money, so I need to make sure I have a consistent income. Thankfully, fighting as many trainers as possible solves both of these problems. There are a few other instances where repels don't completely block wild Pokemon. One of these instances is using the move Rock Smash. However, there are no rocks to smash in Unova. In fact, Rock Smash isn't even an HM. There are only trees to cut, which don't have a chance to trigger a wild encounter. This tree in the Dream Yard is required, but all three elemental monkeys can learn cut. Here, I come awfully close to running into a wild Pokemon. Please, Pink Blob, don't come any closer. On Route 3, there are tons of trainers available to fight, and no mandatory tall grass, allowing me to freely grind without using any repels. Although I did have some close calls. Purell gets all the way to level 17, enough to evolve him into his second stage evolution, Duat. We can stroll to Nacreen City and pick up a very helpful item, the Mystic Water. This makes Purell's water moves even stronger, and this makes him a huge threat, even in bad matchups. 
Nacreen City is where we find Lenora, the second gym leader. Purell gets intimidated so it can't two-shot the Hurtier, and gets down to low health by the time it takes Hurtier out. Having a second Pokemon is amazing here, as Purell can switch out, removing the attack nerf. I can now spend a turn healing up Purell. Additionally, Lenora's Watchog knows Retaliate, which does double damage the turn after a teammate has fainted. So poor Repellent gets sacrificed, but allows me to bring in a fully healthy and fully strong Purell. Two Razor Shells and a Hypnosis Miss, and we have the second badge. Team Plasma is up to no good in the Pinwheel Forest, but there's something even scarier going on. Something that can end my run completely. Now I must deal with Shaking Grass. Remember how repels don't completely prevent wild Pokemon in some situations? Well, Shaking Grass is another situation. Shaking Grass is one of the types of Gen 5 events called Phenomenon. These are a new way of encountering wild Pokemon, and can be randomly triggered whenever the player takes a step. There are four types of Phenomenon. Dust Clouds, Flying Shadows, Rippling Water, and, of course, Shaking Grass. Because repels don't prevent these encounters, this is a very easy way for this run to end. So, what can I do about it? Do I just have to hope that Shaking Grass doesn't appear right in front of me? Well, no. There is one way to prevent this, and that's thanks to one key feature of Phenomenon. Only one may be active at a time. By running back and forth outside the tall grass, I can attempt to trigger Shaking Grass. Now, that's the only one that can be active. Using a repel, I can navigate my way around the Shaking Grass, guaranteed to avoid encountering a wild Pokemon. I do this for every new patch of grass as I make my way through Pinwheel Forest, fighting available trainers along the way. Purell hits level 25 and learns Water Pulse, a 100% accurate move that takes advantage of my higher special attack. Plus, Confusion Chance is nice too. We cross the bridge into Castilia City, where we're completely safe from wild Pokemon. But we do have a few things to do. I pick up a Firestone that can be used on Panseer later, and battle all the trainers in the Battle Company. Even though I haven't seen a wild Pokemon, I'm filling up my Pokedex through trainer battles, giving me enough entries to get the item Eviolite. The Eviolite is an item that boosts your defense and special defense by a staggering 50%, but the Pokemon can't be fully evolved. That applies to Purell, so I switch the Mystic Water with the Eviolite and take on the Bug-type Gym Leader, Berg. Using Water Pulse, Purell can take out Whirlipede without taking damage and elevate to level 29. Berg has a Leaveny, and with its secondary Grass type, it will be a problem for Purell. So I switch into the hyper underleveled Repellent. Despite having a 10 level disadvantage, Repellent can take a weak Razor Leaf, and a four times effective Incinerate does a respectable amount of damage. Since Repellent is about to die, I go for the Hail Mary. Getting a Quick Claw proc allows me to move first, and using Lick, which does almost no damage, but actually paralyzes Leaveny. It still kills Repellent, but allows Purell to outspeed even after String Shot, and avoid a few attacks from Full Paralysis. Berg heals up twice, but Purell can still outlast it, and one-hit KO the final Dwebble. Getting the third badge from Berg allows us to now purchase Super Repels, which doesn't change the functionality, but allows me to take more steps with no risk of wild Pokemon. North of Castilia, I easily defeat Bianca, and although Charon is a bit tougher, Panseer is a perfect counter for Servine, with Incinerate burning up its berry, leading to an easier time for Purell. Route 4 and the surrounding areas like the Desert Resort and Relic Castle don't have tall grass, only sandy areas where wild Pokemon live. Although I still need to use repels here, there's no chance for Phenomenon, so I can freely walk around with absolutely no risk. And there are a ton of trainers here, giving Purell enough experience to hit level 34. In Nimbasa City, I can dress up Purell like a little gentleman, before joining N on a typical Ferris wheel ride, standing up, facing the same direction, confessing our evil plots, 
You know, the normal stuff. Route 16 is a safe optional area with a few extra trainers, allowing Purell to hit level 36 and evolving into his final evolution, Samurott. This comes just in time as we're at full strength to take on the fourth gym leader, Elisa. Elisa has electric Pokemon, very scary against the water type Purell. However, the plus speed nature and the Samurott evolution allow Purell to be faster than the Amolgas, who are so frail that they can be killed with one water pulse. Zebstrika doesn't go down so easy, but Spark doesn't do that much. I can take out Zebstrika for a surprisingly easy fourth badge. Halfway through the gym challenge, and I still haven't encountered a single wild Pokemon. The next destination on our journey is Driftvale City, but to get there, we have to cross the adjoining drawbridge. This is the one location we'll go through with the second type of phenomenon, Flying Shadows. These shadows don't always trigger a wild encounter. In fact, 80% of the time, you get a bird wing item, but still, we don't want to risk it. The difference between this type of phenomena and the Shaking Grass is that with Shaking Grass, I can force it to appear while being outside the risky area. I'm running back and forth outside the tall grass. Here, I can't do that because every tile I step on is one where a flying shadow could appear. So on this bridge, there is no guaranteed way to be safe. The run could end right here, completely up to RNG. All I can do is be extremely careful, which is hard to do because sometimes enormous pillars block my vision. Am I about to walk into a shadow? Hope not. Luckily, I traverse the bridge without a flying shadow in my path and safely make it to Driftvale. At this point, I have so much money that buying repels is no longer an issue. Located just south of the city is the cold storage and I need to fight my way through to take on Team Plasma. Like the desert areas, the cold storage has wild Pokemon, but no phenomena. So I can safely repel and take on all trainers, where Purell hits level 40. This is about 10 levels higher than the gym leader in Driftvale, Clay. With this level advantage and a good type matchup, Purell can one-hit KO all three of Clay's Pokemon, giving us the fifth badge. On Route 6, we have a fun new obstacle, wild encounters that look like items. These Pokemon are extra sus, and I don't know exactly which ones are real, so I just avoid them all. Speaking of avoiding, I'm also avoiding trainers in the middle of tall grass. Shaking grass gets reset by fighting NPCs, so after the fight, I'd be stuck in the middle of tall grass with the threat of shaking grass not present on screen. That's an extra opportunity to mess up. So I'll take a bit less experience in exchange for way more safety. At the end of Route 6, I find a spider web blocking the entrance to the charged stone cave. Clay comes and takes out the web, circumventing actually encountering the wild spider. In other Pokemon games, actual wild Pokemon are used as unavoidable blockades like the Snorlax in Kanto or the Pseudo-Wudo in Johto. But that's not the case here, and we can enter the cave cleanly. However, the cave itself presents another problem. We find the third type of phenomenon here, dust clouds. Similar to the flying shadows on the drawbridge, each dust cloud has a chance for an item, but also a chance for a wild Pokemon encounter. Also like the bridge, there is no safe way to trigger dust clouds, as any tile you walk on could produce the phenomenon. So, once again, I have to slowly, slowly, slowly make my way through the cave, praying that close calls are just that. Close. I don't go out of my way to fight trainers here, taking the quickest path to give myself the least exposure possible. I can literally see the light at the end of the tunnel, but N forces me into a fight. Fortunately, Purell is way overpowered at this point. I breathe a huge sigh of relief as I exit the tunnel, but this won't be the last time I have to go through a cave. In fact, this isn't even the last time I have to go through this cave. But more on that in a bit. Purell is now holding the Lucky Egg, which Professor Juniper gives to me in Charge Stone Cave. This item increases the experience you get from battle. Purell can kill almost anything in one or two hits, 
So the extra boost from the Mystic Water isn't that important. My goal is for Purell to be as high of a level as possible. That way, the Elite Four and Champion fights are easy. For now, I'm in Miss Tralton City, and Skyla asks me to meet her in the Celestial Tower up north. Thankfully, there are handy balance beams that allow me to avoid tall grass, and I can rappel through the Celestial Tower with no threat of phenomenon. I ring the bell at the top of the tower, announcing to the world, I got here without seeing a single wild Pokemon! Uh, good for you. Back in Mistralton, I can take on Skyla, the flying type gym leader. Purell is now approaching level 50 and attacks with the move Scald. Scald is stronger than Water Pulse and has a chance to burn. With this, Purell can one-hit KO Swoobat and Unpheasant, and two-hit KO Swana with Slash for a very easy sixth badge. Through Route 7 and I make it to the base of Twist Mountain, the second location with Dust Cloud possibilities. Working my way through the cave sections is scary, especially walking north because my big giant head blocks me from seeing the space ahead. However, I once again make it through unscathed and find myself in Icarus City. The seventh gym is also a breeze, as the opposing ice moves are weak against Purell, but water moves are strong against them. Now I head to the Dragon Spiral Tower, safely repelling my way. There are some sections where using strength can give you a shortcut, but it's never required. In fact, Outside of that one tree I had to cut in the dream yard so many badges ago, no other HM is required, not even Surf. This is one of the reasons this challenge may be possible in black and white, since catching Pokemon to learn HMs is not a requirement. Although this is the case, HMs certainly make things easier. At the top of the Dragon Spiral Tower, N uses the Light Stone to awaken the legendary Pokemon Reshiram. And to find out more, I'm required to go back to the Relic Castle. You know, that place I visited four gyms ago? Normally, I could just fly back to Nimbasa and walk there, but... I don't have any Pokemon that can learn fly, and I obviously can't catch one. So, you know what that means. I have to walk all the way back there, through Scary Cave number one, Scary Cave number two, Scary Bridge, all without running into a wild Pokemon, again. So, that's what I do. Avoiding wild Pokemon in Twist Mountain, avoiding them in Charged Stone Cave, avoiding them on the Drift Vale Drawbridge, and all the routes with shaking grass in between. Finally, after a long, arduous trek, I make it to the Relic Castle, confronting Getsis and receiving a call to go back to Nacreen City. So, further back I walk obtaining the Dark Stone from Lenora. Now, the team tells me the best thing I can do is fight the Opelucid City Gym Leader, all the way back where I originally was. These adults think I just have all the free time in the world. Luckily, this trip back isn't a complete waste of time. I'm already at the Nacreen Museum, so I can trade in a fossil for a free non-wild Pokemon. I receive Tortuga, naming it another sanitizer in Germex. It may seem like getting another water Pokemon is redundant, but Tortuga is actually the perfect Pokemon for the role it's playing. As an underleveled team member, Tortuga can't do much actual damage. Its main role is to allow me to switch out Purell if he's had stats lowered or his health reduced. Then, I can heal him up and sacrifice the weaker Pokemon. Look, it's not a fun role, but it's an important one. Tortuga is especially great because of its ability, Sturdy. Not only do I get one turn to heal Purell, but because Sturdy prevents the one-hit KO, I get a guaranteed second turn. This could allow me to heal again or do some actual damage. However, Tortuga isn't the only gift Pokemon we can get on this return trip. Even farther back, on Route 1, there is a small opening with a patch of water. So, I teach the move Surf to Purell, and now we can travel across the water. However, water is where the fourth and final phenomenon rears its ugly head. Rippling water can appear randomly, negating the repel and forcing a wild Pokemon encounter. Luckily though, this phenomenon isn't as scary as dust clouds or flying shadows, and it's more akin to shaking grass. 
This is because I can safely stay outside of the water to trigger the rippling effect, navigating around it only after it appears. I do this a few times to make it to Route 17, where an isolated house stands. Here, an NPC gives me a Pokemon egg. We'll have to walk around a bit more to see what's inside. I'm now standing in basically the single farthest point from where I need to be. Walking all the way down here and then all the way back up is not only a huge time sink, but would continue to put this challenge at risk, which is why I'm not walking all the way back. You see, one thing that I declined to mention is that as I made my way down from Icarus City to the Relic Castle to the Nacreen Museum and to the isolated house on Route 17, I passed through multiple cities. And in every single city, I avoided the Pokemon Center. Every single one. Which means Purell isn't very healthy right now. And that means the trainers on Route 17 can kill Samurott quickly, even at his massive level advantage. And with the rest of my team being very weak, they don't stand a chance either. The trainer on Route 17 kills all my Pokemon, causing me to black out and sending me back to the last Pokemon Center I was in, which just so happens to be in Icarus City. That's right, who needs a flying Pokemon when you can insta-travel via death? On Route 8, I can rappel through the shallow water, absolutely dunk on Bianca with my level 60 Samurott, and cross the Tube Line Bridge, which thankfully does not have the Flying Shadow phenomenon. Then, it's a quick jaunt down the street of Route 9, and I've made it to Opelucid City. Getsis is once again acting as a hype man to his boy N, but I have bigger fish to fry. Big, scaly, standing on two legs fish. Dragons. They're dragons. The dragons in this 8th gym fight resist water moves, meaning Surf can't quite kill. Thankfully, Iris likes to go for Dragon Dance. Drudigan's Dragon Tail will force a new Pokemon in, but I can sacrifice them for a safe switch into Purell, who can take her out. Haxorus goes down to two slashes and an Aqua Jet. And now, we've gotten all eight badges without seeing a single wild Pokemon. Route 10 is a very safe route with lots of tough trainers, which is great for gaining experience with zero risk. One of the tough trainers here is Charon, but teaching x Scissor to Purell is an amazing counter for those pesky grass types. At the end of this route is the entrance to Victory Road, the third and final location of Dust Clouds. Since this is the very end of the run, and I'm not 100% safe, I make sure to take it slow and careful. Thankfully, Victory Road is not too long in this game. I take on the few trainers in my way, and by the time we reach the end, Purell has grown to level 68. I say goodbye to the Dust Clouds, exiting the cave and reaching the Pokemon League. League. But even though we're here, our goal of avoiding wild Pokemon is not quite reached. My little egg hasn't hatched yet, so I bike back and forth until it's ready. Finally, the Pokemon inside is revealed, Larvesta. Throughout this challenge, I've embraced my biggest fear, the gross wild Pokemon and their various diseases. But in that time, I've come a long way in facing my fear. And now, I think I'm finally at a place where I can accept a bug Pokemon onto my team, even if it is a bit germy. Larvesta is only at level 1, but it can still be useful. With the Flame Body ability, anyone squashing this bug has a chance to get burned, which cuts their attack in half. That could end up making a huge difference. Before I take on the Elite Four, I have a few things to do to maximize my chance of success. I go ahead and use the Firestone on Repellent, giving me a level 15 Simisir, but he's holding a Quick Claw for maximum chaos potential. Germex is holding the Rocky Helmet for extra damage output, and for Purell, I finally take away the Lucky Egg and give him back the Mystic Water. We've grown so much. Now it's time for pure power. Let's see if gaining experience exclusively from trainer battles is enough to defeat the Elite Four. First, we take on Chantal, and Purell's Surf can't quite one-hit KO Kofagrigus. 
This causes Chantal to use both her full restores on it, which ends up being a blessing in disguise. Chantal's Jellicent is very tanky, and all of Purell's moves are either not very effective or completely useless. Because the full restores are used, I only have to lower Jellicent's health once. I can heal up on Golurk, but it puts a curse on me. However, with just one and a half Pokemon left, I can win the fight before coming close to dying from curse. Grimsley is next, and Scrafty also doesn't die to Surf. Unfortunately, going for Sand Attack. Thankfully, I can still hit with Aqua Jet. And on the next Pokemon, I switch out, sacrificing Jeremy, but bringing Purell back in with no lowered accuracy. Purell can one-hit KO Crocodile, Bisharp, and Lipard, giving us another victory. Third, I take on Caitlyn, killing Reuniclus with one X Scissor, Gothitelle with two, Musharna with two, and Sigliff with a Surf. Finally, I face Marshall, taking out Throw with the Surf, Sock with two Surfs, and one-hit KOing Conkeldur and Mineshow, defeating the Elite Four and reaching level 70. N has just become the champion of the region, not hesitating at all to redecorate the place. I climb the steps to his castle, and finally face off against the prince who is promised. Reshiram bursts through the back wall like an albino Kool-Aid man, and flexes N's immense power. However, I have a power of my own, and the dark stone in my bag shoots out, surrounding the area in a dark aura and awakening the legendary Pokemon Zekrom. So now I need to pause because... I know what you're thinking. The next thing that happens is that we encounter Zekrom and can catch him, therefore losing the challenge, as Zekrom is a wild Pokemon. But does Zekrom really count as a wild Pokemon? All the way back in Nacreen City, Lenora gave me the Darkstone, and Zekrom emerges from the Darkstone itself, so I've already been carrying him around with me. This is validated by the fact that the game forces you to catch Zekrom. It's not a choice. So, in a way, he's already mine, and getting him into a Pokeball is just a formality. Additionally, these legendaries can't be shiny, and I don't just mean they're shiny locked for this situation. Shiny Zekrom and Reshiram are completely impossible to get in Gen 5. This shows that this isn't just some random wild Pokemon, it's THE Zekrom. And finally, let's think back to basics. The iconic, a wild Pokemon appeared text. This isn't just for random grass encounters. This text has been used countless times for legendary Pokemon, including legendary Pokemon in this exact game. But here, we see Zekrom appeared. No mention of a wild Pokemon. So ultimately, does this count as a wild Pokemon? I'm not quite sure. The reasons I just highlighted are why it might not be, but at the end of the day, it's still a Pokemon I don't have in my party, and I can catch it in a Pokeball. All I know is that this situation isn't black and white. I take on N, where Zekrom defeats Reshiram, and Purell easily takes out all five of N's remaining Pokemon. Finally, we're down to the last fight of the game, Getsis. I let Zekrom get Toxic poisoned by Kofagrigus before killing it, allowing Purell to handle the rest of the fight with no status condition. Getsis's Pokemon are definitely strong, so I'm glad Purell is at such a high level. Purell can sweep through Getsis's team, and we show him that Pokemon aren't your friends. They love you because they're used as tools of destruction. Wait, we're the good guys here? And with that, the game is over. Pokemon Black and White has been completed. But did we achieve the goal that we set out to do? Did we complete the game without running into a single wild Pokemon? The answer is... I don't know. I think either argument is valid. So I'll let you guys decide. Let me know in the comments if you think this challenge was successfully completed. I'm very interested to see what you all think. Thank you so much for joining me in this challenge. I made this video in a slightly different style, so if you enjoyed it, give the video a like. That would please Daddy Algorithm. Also, definitely subscribe for more challenges like this one, and check out the video on screen for other crazy Pokemon challenges. Until next time, thank you so much for watching.